Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, Critical Power, Circuit Protection, and Electrical Power Systems, sponsored by ASCO. I'm your moderator, Jack Smith, with Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media. Here are some tips for today's webcast. If you're having trouble with your slides or audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's photo. You can control the volume settings of the webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer speakers. If you have problems, cl uh, click the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to bring up a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. If you do need a technician, type a message into the Ask a Question box and someone will respond as soon as possible in the Answered Questions box. Type questions for today's speakers in the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen. The Q&A portion will start after the prepared presentation in about 45 minutes. If you are on Twitter, tweet your presentation tweet your questions to us at hashtag CSE Circuit Protection. Today's webcast is being recorded and you will receive an email with a link to the archive in about a week. To download the presentation slides, use event resources on the left side of your screen. For those of you interested in receiving one AIA CES approved learning unit and one health, safety, and welfare unit for this event, you need to pass a 10-question exam. To take the learning unit exam and to download your AIEA CES certificate, use the learning unit exam tab option at the top of your screen. <coughs> the exam will open in a new browser window. You can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted on the Consulting Specifying Engineer website with the on-demand version of the webcast. In keeping with the American Institute of Architects continuing education system policy, please take a few moments to read the quality assurance slide. Here is a list of the learning objectives for today's webcast. We'll cover these in today's presentation. Now we will hear from today's sponsor. At the conclusion of the video, you may experience a few seconds of silence to compensate for various internet speeds. Please stay tuned after the video for today's presentation. Now I would like to introduce today's expert presenters. Dana Jensen is one of the founding principals of CERTUS, 
She has extensive experience in the design of reliable and efficient electrical systems for complex healthcare projects. She brings large scale technical expertise and innovative concepts to her role at CERTUS, where she focuses on advances in engineering and technology. Dana was a 2009 Consulting Specifying Engineer 40 Under 40 winner and is a member of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. Rick Rayburn is Director of Electrical Engineering at NV5 and has more than 30 years of experience in the development and design of electrical systems. He has done international projects and large multi-billion dollar hotel casinos in Las Vegas as well as across the nation. Rick is licensed professional engineer in more than 30 states. It's a pleasure to work with both of you today. And Dana, let's kick off this presentation. All right, well thank you very much, Jack, for that lovely introduction. So as Jack said, my name is Dana Jensen and my primary focus is designing electrical distribution systems predominantly for healthcare facilities. But I like to tell my children that I'm saving lives. It just sounds more important and dramatic. Of course, I can in no way take credit for the miracles that healthcare workers perform every day. However, we as electrical engineers play a vital role in making sure that the systems we design are safe for all the building occupants and maintenance staff. With this in mind, we have a lot to cover today since designing electrical circuit protection systems can be a complicated and tedious task. So in order to begin, let's quickly review what is meant by circuit protection. The basic philosophy is to localize and isolate an abnormal condition, such as a fault, and to prevent unnecessary power loss. These together ultimately protect both personnel and equipment. The basic design concepts can range anywhere from physical protection of the conductors themselves to the smart devices that are designed to protect the components by detecting faults and interrupting circuits. There are several types of abnormal electrical conditions that may occur throughout a building's life that an electrical system must be designed to overcome. These are overcurrents or overload, short circuit faults, transients and surges, and other power flow issues such as single phasing of three phase systems and reverse power flow. Understanding what causes these types of faults goes hand in hand with understanding the codes and standards surrounding them. That being said, code comprehension is no easy task since there are so many relevant codes and standards. Some of the major players are those you see here. NFPA 70, which is also referred to as the National Electrical Code or the NEC, is probably the most widely known electrical design code and it's the benchmark for safe electrical design, installation, and inspections to protect people and property from electrical hazards. The National Electrical Safety Code or the NECS is published by the IEEE, and they provide practical guidance to safeguard from electrical hazards during installation, operation, and maintenance. NFPA 70E is the standard for electrical safety in the workplace, and it includes requirements for safe work practices to protect personnel by reducing exposure to electrical hazards. The National Electrical Installation Standards, or NEIS, is published by the National Electrical Contractors Association, and this one dictates standards for performance and workmanship. And lastly, we have OSHA, which stands for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. This is a government agency that enforces standards to assure safe and healthful working conditions. And as if all that was not enough, each of those codes and standards reference additional codes and manufacturing standards that devices designed to meet these requirements must also adhere to. So the list you see here is definitely not exhaustive, but here are a few highlighted ones which are pertinent to today's discussion. UL 489 covers circuit breakers. UL 508 defines the requirements for industrial control devices and their accessories. UL 1066 is the standard for low voltage power circuit breakers. And UL 248-1 applies to low voltage fuses, and UL 977 is the standard for fused power circuit devices. And on top of this, additional standards exist such as IEEE, ANSI, and more. 
Later on in this presentation, Rick is going to go over the specific uses of circuit breakers and fuses that comply with these standards and how to apply them. But the good news is that the manufacturers really bear the responsibility of complying with the bulk of these very detailed UL and IEEE standards. So as long as the design engineer is aware of what is out there, our primary focus and understanding of circuit protection can really be found within the National Electrical Code. Having said that, the NEC doesn't really provide a clear, concise recipe to follow for the system's design. In fact, Article 90.1 of the NEC is very clear in this and states that while providing a practical guide for safeguarding of persons and property from hazards arising from the use of electricity, the NEC is not intended as a design specification or an instruction manual for untrained persons. What it does do, however, is detail out the fundamental principles for circuit protection. So let's take a deeper dive on what causes the type of faults I mentioned and the requirements within the NEC for protecting against them. And we'll touch on how the code has morphed over the years regarding these application strategies. Nearly every article in the, the NEC touches on some form of circuit protection, but it can all be boiled down to these major headlines. Overcurrent and short circuit protection, ground fault and arc protection, selective coordination, arc energy reduction, transient and surge protection, system grounding and bonding, and physical protection. So to begin, an overcurrent is any current in excess of the rated current of the equipment or conductor. It could result from an overload, a short circuit, or a ground fault. Overcurrent protective devices are referred to as OCPDs, and they include circuit breakers, fuses, or relays. These are basically the building blocks of power distribution systems. At the most basic level, these devices are inserted into the distribution system to break or disconnect the circuit if there's an overload or short circuit problem. The NEC has many requirements for overcurrent protected protection, beginning with Article 210.20 for branch circuits and 215.3 for feeders. These articles discuss various requirements, but basically both of them reference the main article, which is Article 240, and that is dedicated to overcurrent protection. It's here that the designer will find the guidelines on sizing criteria, whether it's okay to round up and up or down to the next nearest size of protection, minimum conductor sizes, tap rules, distance limitations, and much more. Article 240 has remained relatively unchanged over the several, last several code cycles, with the exception of one important addition called arc energy reduction, but we'll talk about that in greater detail here in a few minutes. Another type of fault, other than an overload, is a short circuit fault. Ground faults and arc faults are in this category and are caused by a failure of electrical components. A ground fault is typically caused by an inadvertent contact between, between energized conductors and the ground or an equipment frame, and it's really the most common type of fault. A ground fault could be caused by a breakdown in insulation or a loose termination. And when this happens, the return path, which would normally be through the grounding system, now travels through any equipment frame or person touching the system, and they essentially become part of the electrical system. An arc fault is a condition where loose or corroded wiring connections create an intermittent contact that causes electrical current to spark or arc between metal contact points. Both ground faults and arc faults are combated with devices that sense the condition and interrupt the circuit. They are designed for both protection of equipment and personnel. Rick's gonna go over these types of devices in a little bit more detail later in the presentation. The NEC requirement to protect against them can be found all over the code book within Article 210, 215, 230, and 517. And arc fault protection can be found in Article 210.12. The NEC has been regularly updated in these two main areas of protection with every new addition adding more and more requirements. So this is a pretty important strategy for circuit protection. Selective coordination is another form of circuit protection discussed in several sections of the code. This concept is to localize a fault in order to restrict outages to the minimum amount of circuits or equipment. Let's say, for instance, there is a fault on a branch circuit feeding a motor, as depicted in the diagram you see here. 
If the system is lacking selective coordination, the upstream breaker may trip before the nearest breaker to the fault, thereby rendering all the devices that you see in red with an unnecessary power loss. But when a system is designed for selective coordination, only the devices closest to the fault trips as depicted in the figure on the right, leaving the rest of the system up and running as usual. Selective coordination is required by the NEC for many areas, including elevators, critical data centers, fire pumps, and all emergency systems. It was first introduced into the NEC for emergency systems in 2005, and has had several updates and additions throughout the more recent code editions. As I mentioned earlier, the biggest portion of NEC Article 240, which was overcurrent protective devices, that has changed in more recent code editions is the addition of arc energy reduction requirements. And these can be found in NEC 240.67 and 87. The requirement first appeared in the NEC in the 2014 edition and states that for all overcurrent protective devices rated 1200 amps and higher, a means must be provided to reduce the total clearing time of a fault, ultimately making it safer for personnel. The code lists the acceptable strategies of arc energy reduction as differential relaying, zone selective interlocking, energy reducing maintenance switches, arc flash mitigation systems, or systems that employ the use of an instantaneous trip setting or override that is less than the available arc concurrent. Our next type of condition is not necessarily a fault, but rather a disturbance within the electrical system. Surges or transients are brief overvoltage spikes or disturbances on a power waveform that can damage, degrade, or destroy electronic equipment. Most equipment is designed to handle minor variations in their standard operating voltage. However, surges can be very damaging and need to be protected against. Transients and surgeons surges can be caused by either internal or external sources. Internal contributors include on-off switching of loads, inductive coupling, or even static electricity. Internal transients and surges can be either intentional or unintentional, and they're not always immediately recognized or nearly as disruptive as the larger external surges, but they are far more frequent, and over time they can be disruptive and damaging. External contributors to transients and surgeons are, on the other hand, much more disruptive and can be caused by things like poor regulation from a utility company or lightning storms. There are several articles within the NEC that require surge protection. The basic requirements for installation, connection means, and device types and ratings are found within Articles 280 and 285. And specific requirements to include them are found in various applications such as hazardous locations, elevators, critical operations data centers, wind turbines, fire pumps, and again, emergency systems. Proper system grounding is also a major player in circuit protection for both protection of personnel and equipment. Grounding is, by definition, the intentional connection of a current carrying conductor to ground. The two main reasons for grounding per the NEC are number one, to limit the voltages caused by lightning or an accidental contact of supply conductors with conductors of higher voltage, and number two, to stabilize the voltage under normal operating conditions. Grounding equipment provides a ground reference for exposed non-current carrying parts of the electrical system and provides a path for ground fault current to get back to the source. Grounding consists of many components and strategies including the grounding electrode, service grounding, separately derived systems, and equipment grounding. Grounding is a commonly misunderstood topic, and the NEC devotes an entire article, which is Article 250, to grounding requirements. And finally, when considering circuit protection, we must not only consider the devices and components that comprise an electrical system, but also the paths that the circuits are routed and where the equipment is housed. There are several articles within the NEC that discuss physical protection requirements, including Article 230.6 for service conductors, 240.30 for overcurrent protective device locations. Article 695 contains requirements on how fire pump feeders must be routed and protected from damage and fire. And Article 700.10 also has requirements for routing and protection of emergency feeders. These articles touch on equipment location, 
the requirements to be accessed by only authorized personnel, and also how they must be protected from fire. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Rick so he can describe some of the practical applications of how to protect against these faults and conditions. Rick? Thank you, Dana. So let's start back to the basics just to touch on. Uh, overcurrent protection uh, is defined as stated here as any current in excess of the rated current of the equipment or opacity of a conductor. It can result from an overload, short circuit, or ground fault. That's pretty broad. A lot of people think of overcurrent as being the thing that protects everything. Uh, it's broken down into many different pieces as we've seen from Dana's protect, uh, pro projections earlier and discussions. Overcurrent protection uh, for a device, a device is a, for a branch circuit. A device capable of providing protection for branch circuits and equipment over the full range of overcurrents between its rated current and its interrupting ratings. So what's that really saying? That's saying that in a panel board, a typical small panel board that you might be utilizing as a last protection on a branch circuit, uh, could be rated at 100 amp for the panel board. The, the uh, over the I'm sorry, the uh, interrupting rating of that panel board may be listed at 10,000 AIC, which means that the breaker internally typically is rated also at 10,000 amps. So that, that tells you that the, the overcurrent rating for the, the standard protection is from 20 amps to 10,000 amps, a wide range. And you can look up uh, curves for typical breakers and see their uh, curve settings for different times of faults and uh, the values of current that have to flow through that device, and it still provides protection throughout its range. Conversely, a fuse can be used for the same application. Uh, we have uh, fuses that you'll see in uh, the selective coordinations that will provide protection, again, throughout their range that may be rated up to, for a branch circuit application, up to 50,000 amps, but it's much more defined and in my opinion, a little easier to selectively coordinate. So uh, the protection provided may be overload, short circuit, ground fault, or a combination depending upon its application. The short circuit protection of it, again, is when, when there's a uh, fault in the system and the equipment's uh, nominal voltage, at the equipment's nominal voltage, and it'll essentially cause damage, posing hazards to pr uh, property and, and people. So in the short circuit application would be a situation where you've got uh, an, an accidental uh, fault, either to ground or from phase to phase. That breaker or that fuse will need to open that circuit quickly and promptly to minimize the uh, current that flows on that circuit. So it could be anywhere in the range of its time settings and its, uh, and its values uh, that it's listed for. A typical application of this might be uh, if we have a 12 gauge conductor, for instance, a THWN 75 degree C copper conductor, and it's an ambient uh, temperature of 86 degrees. All those things are important to understand as a specifying engineer because you need to know how that conductor is going to be placed into service. If, for instance, if you're running it within a conditioned building of 86 degree Fahrenheit or less, the conductor is going to operate in its normal conditions. But if you put that outside in a direct sunlight in Las Vegas, for instance, the temperatures can exceed 120, 150 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which limits its uh, capability of carrying currents. You have to derate it. So the allowable opacity in this particular case is 25 amps based upon the NEC Table 310.15, B16. Um, and per NEC 240.4D limitation of this overcurrent, of overcurrent protection on this number 12 conductor is 20 amps. So that means even though it's listed by the chart of 25 amps capabilities, we can't protect it anything higher than 20 amps. So the fault current uh, this conductor can carry is 2,700 amps for one cycle at 60 hertz. The clearing time of a fuse is typically less than a half cycle. So a fuse will protect this, this conductor within a half cycle. 
The clearing time of a power or airframe circuit type breaker is typically three cycles due to the thermomagnetics within the breaker. So it will have to carry that current for up to three cycles. The conductor itself is limited to 2700 amps, so that 20 amp breaker for this type of application would have to limit the current to 2700 amps for the uh, one cycle to be able to uh, work the conductor properly in this operating environment. Now we design most systems for worst case. The actual applications in the field, we may be designing it for uh, 16 amps of continuous load, but the actual application of the field is going to vary from very small amperage up to 16 amps. So a feeder in the same application for article NEC 700, again, NEC 700 is uh, emergency systems. The requirement for the typical branch circuit in a normal power application, assuming we have a 100 amp feeder consisting of number three conductor, a THWN 75 degree and an 86 degree ambient condition. Uh, this feeder is serving a panel board and has the af aforementioned 20 amp overcurrent device in it. In normal operating conditions, the use of a 100 amp overcurrent protection device will function just fine, a uh, circuit breaker or a fuse. But in the NEC 700 system, it's required to be selectively coordinated so that the branch circuit overcurrent protection device, that 20 amp device, is coordinated with that upstream device. Uh, let's see, the event of a fault or current, uh, this uh, should have been 20 amp overcurrent protection device shall be selectively coordinated, or 100 amp should be selectively coordinated with the 20 amp, such that the 20 amp will open first. So again, that, that falls back to these curves that I was talking to before. Overlaying of the curves of the particular components you're listing in the system have to be selectively coordinated so that at no point along that curve does it touch the, the curve for the protection device above uh, being selectively coordinated. In a standard operating system, should you design a system that has a 100 amp overcurrent uh, device above it with a 20 amp device below it and the curves overlaid and in the instantaneous range, that range that is less than 0.1 seconds, um, the amperage uh, has to interrupt to protect for the interrupt rating of that equipment. It's okay in the typical operating system that we have those overlaying, but in Article 700, we're not allowed to do that. They have to fall all the way down to 0.0, .0 seconds. Ground fault and arc fault protection. Again, Ground fault is an unintentional ground conductor connection between an ungrounded conductor of an electrical circuit and the normal current carrying conductors. So one question I always have is there's a, uh, the discussion of ungrounded or a grounded circuit conductor. What is that? Well, that's our neutral conductor. So taking a ground conductor and bonding it to an ungrounded conductor or a grounded conductor, either one, is unintentional, uh, could be unintentional in case of uh, ground fault. So an arc fault, conversely, is the arcing connection between the current carrying conductor, broken or poor connection, intermittent connection between the current carrying conductor and the non-current. Uh, we typically see the application of these for norm, uh, most people is in the kitchen, for instance, a ground fault circuit interrupter, or an arc fault for those devices and, and receptacles uh, throughout your home. 2017 covers majority of your house now. Requirements in 2020 are getting more stringent every time. It's because we found that by applying these codes, uh, it protects those people who are unlearned and also eliminates uh, fires in the case of arc fault over time. Uh, so ground fault protection, uh, again, typically is, is considered to be around between the four and six milliamp range, a five milliamp uh, overcurrent device. And it's gonna be providing protection uh, for those faults that go to ground. Now that if it's going through a person to ground, uh, we need to minimize that because when that current crosses your heart, it's been recognized that five to six milliamps can cause the, the heart to stop or, or uh, stop beating properly and go into fibrillation. Uh, the GF, uh, GFPE, or ground fault protection for equipment, conversely, is 
typically range from 30 milliamps, which would be for like a heat, uh, heat, heat trace circuit, up to well, whatever setting, such as in a 1200 amp, I'm sorry, in a 3000 amp service uh, at 480 volt, uh, we would typically use a, a setting that might be one third of that overcurrent protection as just a rule of thumb. Uh, and the settings for the second uh, timing of it has to occur within one second. But that's up to the specifying engineer to, to specify that again in selective coordination systems and non-selective coordination systems. Arc fault protection. Uh, again, we talked briefly about that just a moment ago. The, that's requirements for uh, protecting on typically branch circuits is where this is most generally seen in residences, and now it's a requirement in guest rooms also, hotels and casinos and other locations. Um, you can, uh, it seems to be expanding and expanding, that's because we recognize less and less fires when we see this. This usually is a component of a frayed uh, lighting uh, fixture cable that might be installed uh, somewhere where it's being rubbed up against all the time and uh, the conductor uh, fails over time with slow arcing occurring, the, this device recognizes the signature of that sine wave and sees that, and when it exceeds its limitations, it'll trip the device. And there are devices uh, in circuit breakers that are now both AFCI and GFCI uh, devices. So let's follow the selective coordination briefly. Selective coordination, we've talked at length on that, but just as a, a ratio for your selective coordination devices, I've always used the, the, the statements that if I go a two to one ratio for a, two and a half to one ratio for a, a fuse downstream to a fuse upstream, chances are very, very likely that I'm gonna be selectively coordinated. In the case of multi case circuit breakers, uh, it's very difficult to selectively coordinate those if they're not, uh, a large range between the low, lower uh, uh, multi case circuit breaker and the upper stream multi case circuit breaker. It can be done, but there has to be quite a gap between those two. Uh, power circuit breakers uh, are fully adjustable typically for LSIG, and you've probably heard that long, short, interrupting, and ground fault protection. And the adjustability adjusts the points on that curve so that the upstream device doesn't touch the ground downstream device. Uh, we have 700, we talked about that. We also have 701 that has the same requirements as 700 for selective coordination. And typically in buildings that we do, um, these are important, important facts for our life safety system to make sure that those two to five, six, you know, however many people are in that building, thousand people, um, can evacuate that building with the knowledge, our knowledge that's gonna be safe for those systems to operate in the case of a fire or a, a, a power outage condition. Arc energy reduction. So arc energy reduction is pretty wide now and pretty uh, uh, deep, I'll say. So there's several different methods that you can provide arc flow. So first off, the question is, is why do we provide arc energy reduction? So that falls back to how much fault current do we have available at a component? And what's that component listed for as far as how much arc fault it can handle before it becomes dangerous or explodes? Um, typically when arc faults occur, plasma is generated when it's metal to metal. And the plasma is in the, in the form of, in the air adjacent, it superheats the air. And many times people over the life, lifetime of electrical installations have inhaled that plasma. Uh, and that basically, in addition to the, the burns that they receive, uh, the trauma they have when that blast hits their body, uh, un unfortunately causes loss of life. We can't, that's unacceptable for us. We can't allow that. We want to do everything we can to minimize that. So the invention of PPE came into place with OSHA um, and others to protect the, the person that's working on a piece of equipment that is live. So the first method of protection is to turn the equipment off. Go upstream, turn it off. Well, for my purposes, I have casino operators that tell me we will never turn the casino off. So we need to make sure that that casino is functioning all the time. So therefore, it's very important that we understand how much fault current is available at the panel board or at the 
the switchboard, or even at the device, such as a, a large motor. Manufacturers will list that equipment, and they've tested it to meet the, the available fault current um, that's listed on their product. So we have to go through, calculate how much from the utility company to that location of fault current we may see at that device, and provide protection uh, with the components to minimize it. So there's several different methods. We've uh, mentioned zone selective interlocking. So zone selective interlocking is a methodology utilizing uh, essentially breakers uh, within the system or few switches within the system that uh, uh, talk to each other. And so it may, if a fault is recognized at a low stream device, it'll send a signal to the upstream breaker uh, to say, hey, uh, lower your settings into a safe condition or uh, disable your time function so you're not waiting a certain period of time. I've got a high, high incident fault energy here and so by uh, tripping that breaker upstream I've limited the available fault at that, at that component. Differential relaying is a, a similar function in the fact that it's going to limit the fault of the device. Uh, we see uh, in our applications, we see a lot of energy reducing maintenance switching and local status indicator. That basically is a, a switch in the uh, system that's that the maintenance personnel prior to opening that equipment put into a selective position that, that shortens the time frame and uh, lowers the trip settings uh, for an instantaneous situation should they accident, have an accident when they're working on that gear. So it's gonna trip that device much faster than it would under normal conditions. The light is so that it reminds them to put it back in the, the other position so they don't have nuisance faults or nuisance strippings after they leave the gear. Um, while they have that switch in that maintenance position, the overcurrent device settings are still functional. So they're still functional for uh, all parameters that they're in. It's just that they've lowered the settings on the instantaneous uh, fault uh, current values. Um, appr other approved means that you know is one of the things I've kind of skipped over the instantaneous trip setting, less available arc currents, and, and the override that's less available uh, instantaneous override. Um, again, you can read up on these. I don't want to spend too much more time on them, but uh, other approved equivalent means is basically even the the, the door open for items that people may have come up with with new uh, equipment, new devices, new components, to go to the AHJ and get approval to utilize that in lieu of this, these tested systems. One piece of equipment would be where it has um, an active system built into it that is monitoring the sine wave and the currents that are flowing, and it automatically takes the fault to ground at its point to minimize the fault currents uh, above a certain value of destroying the equipment and hurting personnel. Transient uh, surge protection, uh, it's a requirement of 695, 700, 708. We talked about those that Dana did. Um, uh, transient surge protection a lot of times is misinterpreted as being uh, capable of mitigating harmonics or uh, other applications such as overcurrent, things of that nature. The things that uh, Applications of these is an emergency 700 systems. Uh, transient voltage surge suppression is now a requirement of the code. So on the distribution system equipment, we have to place surge protection uh, at those locations as SPDs. The other, the other uh, indication or other piece of equipment here is uh, uh, lightning protection or uh, uh, I've, I've forgotten the term right now. <laughs> anyway. Transient voltage surge suppression is uh, is widely used, and it's a requirement of the code now uh, for certain applications, and used to, as Dana mentioned, to uh, clip or minimize the sine wave into back into a closer to a sine wave function, uh, and thus protecting the downstream and the equipment that it's connected to. We typically see that, as was mentioned in switching circuits, switching mode power supplies. Harmonic mitigation can be used in conjunction with surge protection to, again, another component of uh, 
mitigating uh, the abnormalities in the circuit uh, for a safer operation of the equipment and thus protection of people. System grounding and bonding. We have to have grounding and bonding uh, to have a, a return path for those faults. If we don't have a grounding and bonding system installed properly, torqued to the proper levels for all connections, and installed per the manufacturer's recommendations, or re not recommendations, but requirements, that system, uh, overcurrent device may not function the way you've designed it. So if I have a fault current or a fault occur in the system uh, at the, the branch circuit level, how does that current, where does that circuit current go and how does it get back to make sure that that overcurrent device sees it quickly and reacts promptly to protect that branch circuit? It's uh, typically for ground faults, it's through our, our ground fault system. Uh, and I'll turn this over to Dana now for uh, discussions on uh, some applications. Yeah, thanks, Rick. So now that we have reviewed all the tools and practical applications for circuit protection, we hopefully have a good understanding of the design requirements, but it doesn't end there. Uh, equally important is the installation of the system components and testing for completion. Both the design and construction teams have to work together to ensure that the systems are installed per code and as intended. Um, so Rick and I just wanted to stress the importance of this and share with you a couple of stories from some instances we've come across over the course of our careers, um, which provide some real world examples of what could possibly go wrong with improperly applied circuit protection strategies or when best practices are not adhered to or completed. The first example here is the lessons learned from a recent project I was working on here in North Texas. It was a high rise office building with some outpatient and ambulatory services housed within a fast track project with little room for error in the construction schedule. So as a result, the building was not fully commissioned and the electrical systems weren't tested prior to the owner move-in. Shortly after move-in, there was a ground fault in the system. The fault was sensed and ultimately disconnected at the main service breaker that was equipped with the ground fault equipment protection that we discussed earlier. This de-energized the normal power to the full facility and prompted the emergency engine generators to start. Now, it sounds pretty common, and at first blush, all of the circuit protection devices put in place acted properly, right? Well, the unfortunate part is that the fault occurred on a Saturday, and the generator ran all night, partially into Sunday, until finally the generator ran out of fuel. The building was completely without power by the time the first occupants arrived on Monday morning, and the facility engineering staff did not even have any knowledge of it happening. So what went wrong? Well, it was, it was pretty easily discovered through the building management software system, system that a motor had shorted and caused the ground fault. The motor was easily replaced, but why had such a seemingly small event caused such a vast outage? The motor was provided with all the proper internal overload protections and even ground fault protection. However, the ground fault protection nearest the fault isn't the one that tripped. Rather, it was that main for the whole facility. And, because it was, and that's because it was set to the factory default setting, which is typically the lowest setting possible. That motor was not even on the emergency power system, but since the main went out, so did the normal power feed to the transfer switch, which called for the engine to start and continue to run. So the engineer had gone to the trouble of designing a selectively coordinated system, provided the proper circuit breaker settings to the team, but the final necessary step didn't happen, which is adjusting those final settings. One other thing that went wrong was knowing that this facility was not going to be manned 24-7, the engineer had called for remote monitoring of the emergency power system. It was also discovered at that time that the communication wire had not been connected nor tested, so it failed to notify the building engineering team over the weekend that the engine was running, which could have prompted some earlier attention. Had they known, they could have started the investigation sooner and saved the scramble on Monday. So luckily, this story doesn't result in any equipment or personnel damage, other than the checkbook for the 1,000 gallons of fuel loss but it could have been substantially reduced. So the lessons learned is the importance of completion and commissioning. The design could be completely perfect, but without the proper implementation and follow through, the problems are bound to happen. Back to you, Rick. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to discuss was a, a project here in Las Vegas that, uh, that we had a casino uh, that had been designed and operation for several years of which a cable in an underground vault uh, 
uh, failed. Uh, it was a medium voltage cable, uh, and in that same vault was two or three other cable circuits, cabled circuits. Um, they were fed in a loop situation around the facility, and when that occurred, the overcurrent device for that particular cable um, failed, or opened, I'm sorry, it did fail. It opened, and it disrupted the power to the facility for what that particular circuit was feeding. The facility's operations personnel recognized, obviously, that they were getting a lot of calls in because this was a loop, so it fed into the facility in several locations uh, and uh, disrupted different uh, portions of the building's operations. The facility's engineers staff that was on, on uh, service that night went to the, to the electrical room, found the breaker that had tripped, and closed it back in. Well, the mistakes made there are number one, uh, you shouldn't unclose, you shouldn't close a, a tripped breaker because of a ground fault or because of a fault condition or because even nuisance tripping, unless you understand why it tripped. That's the first uh, first mistake that was made. So when he closed it in, obviously this manhole that these cables were in was remote from where he was at. Uh, that cable was energized again and failed again, and this time released a number of joules into that manhole, uh, which, because the particular cable that failed happened to be at the lower portion of a rack of cables, it, that uh, quantity of power that was released into that hole and that arcing fault caused cables upstream of it or above it to uh, uh, fail also. So that first one tripped again, and then almost moments later, a second one tripped. Uh, the facility guy that was there was starting to panic. He closed his breaker back in again and closed the other breaker back in, which proceeded to release larger quantities of power into the facility, and which caused more cables to fail. Now, this happened three times. Uh, in the long term, it lifted the explosion was large enough that lifted the manhole cover and threw it out in the air and across the across the way. Um, and of course, the casino facility now went going from uh, let's say one third of a power loss to uh, two thirds of a power loss, and then ultimately to uh, almost a full power loss. The only thing that was uh, still functional was the emergency system, because the emergency system, life safety system, was in a different vault system, as it should be, as the code requires. However, this was in the evening when the normal staff was, was not present. Uh, they called in and, and were getting updates and driving in quickly to the property, and they made the decision right then and there to evacuate the facility because they didn't know what was going on. Uh, so human intervention of untrained personnel can lead to disasters and does all the time. Uh, we have to be thoughtful about that and, and the maintenance staff operating these uh, facilities that have large quantities of power available and massive distribution systems that are very complex with, uh, with uh, availability uh, of multiple feeds to things, uh, they have to understand the system. We can't have uh, personnel operating these systems that are not under, understanding it. So the things that, that don't get recognized when that happens is, number one, obviously police fire were called out, uh, they evacuated the facility, loss of income, uh, and then, of course, from my standpoint, the number of hours needing to sit in uh, attorneys' offices and uh, discussions that go on to try to describe and understand what happened, why, and what failed, and how come uh, it didn't operate properly. Well, the truth was it did operate properly, um, and that was what the outcome was, but that was six months to a year later. Um, so those unpleasant times, those times that you end up putting in is what your insurance uh, assists you with, and it's important to have liability insurance and uh, that assist you with the protection of your lifelong endeavor of electrical engineering. I'm going to turn it back over to, to Donna for uh, the next one. Okay, so um, here's another quick story we're going to go through. Um, 
this is a situation where there was an improper code application and it left the hospital without emergency power. Uh, it was luckily it was after midnight on a Sunday, so not a completely occupied building, but a 40-year-old hospital surgery department experienced a line-to-ground fault on a single-phase 20-amp critical branch circuit. Fault was detected in the system, generators fired up, and power was restored to the critical branch in a matter of seconds. Um, that still doesn't sound like a huge ordeal. Hospitals are designed to overcome these situations and are provided with reliable electrical distribution systems for exactly this scenario. So hospital staff, engineering staff, heard the generators coming. They needed to have a little bit of time to assess the situation. That is until their phones started ringing. Uh, what they soon discovered was that while the generators were running, they actually weren't supplying power to the end use devices on this particular critical branch. So that's when the panic set in. Uh, what, they, what they finally did discover was that the original ground fault occurred at a light fixture in the corridor outside of one of the ORs. There's a very old water line uh, that had sprung a leak and was dripping onto the electrical connection, thereby causing caused the ground fault. That ground fault, as I mentioned, was detected in the normal power circuit breaker, but switched over to the emergency power circuit breaker. But unfortunately, that emergency breaker was also equipped with ground fault equipment protection, which actually is not permitted by code. So that sends to that same fault, and it also tripped, thereby rendering that whole critical branch without power from either the utility or the emergency generator. So this, fortunately for this story, they were able to quickly pinpoint the issue and get the critical branch up and running with no lives lost, but it really could have been a catastrophe. Um, after the event, basically the hospital realized, wow, we've got a really aged facility and let's do some research because that brought to life several other code deficiencies and overall reliability concerns. So just another lesson learned on when working in old facilities, do some due diligence, the staff should invest in the money to upgrade aged electrical systems because lives are on the line. All right, Rick, back to you. Okay, I'll keep this real short and sweet. We're running out of time. Oh. Uh, this is a, a very, very similar situation to the ones we've talked about before. This is where we just had a main overcurrent uh, protected for ground faults as required by code. Um, unfortunately, it was never commissioned. And so as, as stated earlier in one of the discussions, uh, the facility tripped on opening night. Um, we were able to recognize it via phone call, had the adjustments made at that particular point in time over the phone, uh, the facility came back online. But it's, it just brings to the point of, it, we can go through all these uh, adjustments, we can go through all these uh, settings, all these calculations and everything else, but if we don't have someone commission them, and make sure that the settings are functioning properly and working, uh, it's thrown out the window. And that's uh, the short and sweet of it. So I'll turn this back over to Jack. Thanks. Thank you, Dana and Rick, for the first rate presentation. And now our presenters will answer questions about circuit protection. Type your questions in the Ask a Question box on your screen. Please indicate which speaker you would like to answer your question by typing their name before the question. We will get to as many questions as time allows. Additional information will be posted online at www.csemag.com with the archived version of the webcast to take the learning unit exam and to download your AIA CES learning unit certificate, use the learning unit exam option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in the new browser window. You can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted on the Consulting Specifying Engineer website at www.csemag.com with the on-demand version of the webcast. Now let's answer some of these questions. Dana, how does GFCI work and why do we why do they go bad? Well, that's a great question. So the the fundamentals behind a GFCI is that it, ha it has a current transformer basically inside that monitors any imbalance of current between the phase wire and the neutral. So if everything's going right, then both the current entering and leaving of the device is the same, minus some minor losses. So if the CT senses any imbalance that's greater than 5 milliamps, then the switching contacts de-energize the device. That's how it works. 
Um, there's several reasons why NGFI fails. First of all, if it does keep dripping, kind of like the story that Rick told, um, you may just have a problem. Um, particularly in a wet location, there's a high possibility that there actually is a ground fault that it's detecting. So you need to investigate that. Um, another reason why they fail is that um, they could be wired incorrectly. Um, fortunately for this, UL actually requires all listed GFI, GFCI devices to include a um, protection so it kind of gives a little indicator light to let you know if the device is wired wrong and it actually won't operate. And then another reason why GFIs actually may go bad is due to those uh, transients and surges that we talked about earlier in the presentation. Uh, this, since there are components inside of the device, if there's a facility that experiences a whole lot of or big volume of these surges, then those, um, those components fail as well. Um, but similarly, UL also requires GFCIs to include an end-of-life protection where the device actually is now smart enough to know when it's gone bad and it will stop working. So that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the time it needs to be replaced. Thank you. Rick, next question goes to you. What is the difference between fully rated and series rating for fault current analysis? Okay, thanks, Jack. The Good question. The, the series rating panel board is basically a piece of equipment. Is equipment that might be listed, for instance, I'll use the example of a panel board. A panel board typically uh, would be rated at 10,000 minimum for a 122 8 volt system. And upstream of that uh, would be the overcurrent protection note that's protecting that panel board. Um, in the case of a high uh, fault current, available fault current from a facility, um, there may be, let's say, 15,000 amps available at that panel board, is what you've calculated. So if there's 15,000 amps and you have a fault on that panel board, that panel board's going to come apart. Something's going to happen that's dangerous, and potentially fire or, or personnel. So a series rated system, you can provide that panel board list from the manufacturer that's listed with the upstream device uh, that will actually limit the fault to less than 10,000 amps, uh, thereby protecting that equipment and, and handling it. So for instance, let's take a 10,000 amp motor case circuit breaker panel board, and we have a fused switch above it. Well, a fuse switch will limit the fault. Uh, an example this morning, it limited the fault that was calculated around uh, uh, 11 or 12,000 to being around 3,500. Um, again, it, it, every instance is different, and it needs to be listed by the manufacturer as being capable of being series rated. Once you do that, you have to put labeling on that equipment to say this is a series rated panel board or a series rated piece of equipment with the upstream device. That upstream device also has to be labeled. And the, and the inspection agency has to know that that's listed and labeled in that fashion because guess what? If there was substitution made of a piece of equipment or a breaker upstream, it may not provide that same protection. And the let through may allow that breaker downstream or that equipment downstream to fail in a fault condition, thereby injuring or hurting someone. We can't have that. Uh, fully rated is basically exactly that. The equipment is fully rated to handle the fault that's calculated to be present at it. So instead of a, if I had a calculated 18,000 amps, I could opt to put a 22,000 amp piece of uh, panel board in place that is fully rated to carry the maximum fault that's calculated at that point. That's about it. Thanks, Jack. Thank you, Rick. Uh, we have time for one more question, and Dana, you get it. Why does the code limit ground fault protection of a feeder or a service to 1,200 amps? Why not a lesser value? Well, that, that is a great question. Um, so I get to, to remind us what Rick talked about earlier. Um, the code requires ground fault protection of equipment for services that don't um, exceed 1,000 amps. And then it says the setting of that ground fault, the maximum setting is 1,200 amps. Now, ground fault, as I mentioned from my stories, it, it could tend to have nuisance tripping. Um, if it is set too low, it could start to sense faults. Um, so what you have to keep in mind is that codes are minimum. They are exactly that, they're minimum. It doesn't prevent you from being safer and putting the settings lower, but the intention is to not limit it and give you those unwanted shutdowns or maybe nuisance tripping. 
Um, I believe that the requirement for ground fault protection of equipment was, gosh, it was back in the 70s when it was inserted into the NEC, and that was because of um, larger capacity uh, systems were, you know, burning down. So that's why they limited that to 1,000 amps, and then again, the 1,200 amps is just, you got you to gotta start somewhere. So hopefully that answers the question. Yep. You nailed it. Okay, I'd like to thank our great speakers, Dana Jensen and Rick Rayburn, for their time and their expertise. Thanks for your answers, and thank you to our audience for the great questions. And I'd also like to extend a special thank you to our sponsor, ASCO, for supporting today's webcast. And now that we're just about done, we want your feedback. A short survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it. We use this information to improve our webcasts. Finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media, thanks for attending this webcast. This now concludes our webcast. Thank you and goodbye.